Good afternoon. As I understand, there was an organizational mishap, but I believe that you not hold grudge against me, and you understand the difficulties with our schedule. So, good afternoon once again, dear colleagues. Our approaches to relevant international issues were touched upon in substance by President Vladimir Putin, especially during the press conference in December and during the address to Federal Assembly. I would like to highlight that the world is changing very rapidly, and the key destabilizing factor is the aggressive behavior of a number of Western countries, first and foremost the United States, as they want to disrupt the international and legal architecture of security and substitute the international law by their own rules-based international order. This includes uh, Washington's disruption of the INF Treaty. It's further complicating the prospects of extending the New START Treaty, the artificial escalation of the situation in the Gulf, their attempts to review uh, the recognized legal basis for Middle Eastern uh, settlement, as well as uh, military buildup of NATO close to Russian borders, and the disruption of multilateral mechanisms which prevent uh, the spread of of weapons of mass destruction. The deficit of trust in global politics and economy is further aggravated by the use of such methods as unfair competition, protectionism, trade wars, and one of such flagrant examples are the attempts of the US to create stumbling blocks uh, in the implementation of Nord Stream 2. And Washington is abusing its privileges of a country which hosts the United Nations headquarter. And by their own accord and in breach of international law, uh, they um, do not provide the opportunity for undesired states to take part in the events on the UN platform. And those are the new rules and their new uh, expression. And we are, the Russian diplomacy, are holding on to an independent uh, multi-vectoral foreign policy course. And we are undertaking a lot of efforts in order to de-escalate international tensions to strengthen legal and democratic basis for interstate communication and support global and regional security in all of its dimensions. One of our key priorities is uh, fighting international terrorism, including in the Syrian Arab Republic. We are also promoting political process in this country and resolving the most acute humanitarian issues of the Syrian people. Uh, last year, we saw the launch of the um, Constitutional Committee, thanks to the joint efforts of the Astana Format, and now it's very important to uh, restore the country after the conflict and to reintegrate it into the Arab family. And we will try to help with that. We've also made a contribution in overcoming other conflicts in the Middle East and Northern Africa, including in Libya, Yemen, an important step in trying to ameliorate the situation in the region as a whole would be the implementation of Russia's concept of collective security in the Gulf. We have presented it, an updated version, in September of uh, last year as part of a scientific workshop with the participation of all the scientific experts uh, from the region. Our traditional priority is to boost our cooperation in Eurasia, first and foremost as part of the CSTO, uh, the Union State and the CIS countries, and the Eurasian Economic Union. I would like to highlight our successes when it comes to Eurasian integration, including the broadening of foreign ties of uh, uh, Eurasian Economic Union. We have signed a free trade agreement with uh, Singapore and Serbia and before that with Vietnam. And last year uh, we saw the entry into force uh, the agreement on trade and economic cooperation between the Union and China as well as temporary agreement with Iran. We are continuing our negotiations with Israel and Egypt and we have launched the process with India. All these actions are part of President Putin's initiatives to form the greater Eurasian partnership, which is open for all countries of our common continent, that is Eurasia. We saw the expansion of Russian-Chinese uh, relationships of comprehensive partnership and strategic cooperation as part of the state visit of President Xi Jinping in June of last year. 
uh, we have noticed that they entered a new epoch and foreign policy coordination between Moscow and Beijing was a stabilizing influence in the world. We also saw the strengthening of the special privileged uh, strategic partnership with India, multilateral ties with ASEAN countries as well as other countries in Asia and Latin America. An important boost was given to uh, Russia's cooperation with Africa in October of last year. We hosted the first ever summit Russia-Africa and the outcomes uh, of this summit uh, has allowed our relationships to reach a new level. We have also managed to see some developments in the resolution of Ukrainian crisis. After a gap of three years, we, host, uh, we saw another uh, Normandy format summit. After the new authorities in Kiev have managed to undertake steps to implement the decisions of the two previous summits. We hope that the decisions taken in Paris would allow us to implement the package of Minsk measures. Of course, they should not be just uh, in letter, but also in spirit, like it was in uh, uh, the times of Poroshenko. So, another step in the normalization of the functioning of uh, the Council of Europe, um, and we have managed to work on preventing the arms race in space and the weaponization of cyberspace. We are going to continue working within uh, the EAEU and the G20, as well as part of our chairmanship in BRICS and SCO. We are also going to pay special attention to working as a P5 in the Security Council, and one of our priorities priorities is to keep the, the central role of the UN in global affairs and um, keeping and adhering to its foundation principles in its charter, and most of the states uh, stand in solidarity with us in this issue. And in conclusion, I would like to say that uh, this um, upcoming year uh, we'll see two major anniversaries, 75 years since the victory in the Great Patriotic War, and 75 years uh, since the creation of the United Nations. We will do everything in our power to counter any uh, falsifications of history and keep the good memory of the victorious soldiers as well as not to allow to revise the internationally recognized outcomes of the defeat of Nazism. And many of the responsible states support us in this, and I would like to highlight the contribution of our compatriots who live abroad. We are expecting to see our foreign partners uh, during the celebratory events on the 9th of May. Now I'm ready to take your questions. International Chinese Radio, please. Are they numbered? Yes, yes, they are always numbered. Thank you very much, Mr. Lavrov. I'm a correspondent of the joint agency of Russian Chinese uh, news agencies, and we know that Russia and China this year have jointly marked 75 years um, since the victory in the Second World War, and both our countries have done a lot for post-conflict or world order construction, and what is their role in supporting global stability and how do Russian Chinese cooperation develop in this area? Thank you. I have already touched upon our strategic relationships with China. We have similar approaches to all the key issues on the international agenda. Our assessments and our views of the possible and prospective development of the world are reflected in our joint documents, which have been signed by President Xi Jinping and President Putin, including the declaration which has allowed our relationships to reach a qualitative new level. It was signed in June during the official visit of the President of China to Russia. We are closely coordinating our steps within the United Nations. We are always trying to support each other and to defend the principles which the United Nations is based on, that is, the principles that are enshrined in the UN Charter. In the Security Council of the United Nations, when we are considering the issues related to the need to defend those very principles in uh, uh, case of crisis, just like it recently was the case when we considered the, human, the issue of delivering humanitarian aid to Syria, we vote uh, 
in um, harmony and we always support justice and we try not to allow decisions to be taken that are being enforced by our Western colleagues in order to promote their unilateral agenda while not taking into account the need to come up with consensus decisions. I, by the way, mentioned the decision which was adopted while taking into account Russia's and China's positions on extending the mechanism of transborder humanitarian aid to Syria, and our Western partners have tried to do everything in their power in order to keep just one crossing point for humanitarian aid delivery through the border with Iraq between Iraq and Syria. It was called Erubia, and they were lamenting that without this crossing point, the Syrians who live in the northeast would be in a very deplorable state, and that would be a humanitarian catastrophe. We knew that it was not the case, and our Western colleagues just needed to keep this uh, crossing point in order to legitimize uh, the illegitimate presence of the American armed forces and the coalition they had uh, in the eastern bank of the Euphrates. But if we would consider the overall situation with uh, humanitarian aid delivery uh, in the eastern bank of the Euphrates, the statistics are s just like that. Over two months in October and November of last year, the United Nations, with the support of the Syrian government, uh, have um, sent from Damascus and Kamishli around 420 uh, cargo uh, cups just over the two months. And f over the Yerubia crossing point for 20 months, they have sent just around 100 units. So you can see there's a great difference from what is done by the Syrian Arab Republic, by the International Red Cross Society. This is just one example how we and our Chinese colleagues, our strategic partners, have to defend the facts and we try to avoid the Security Council turning into a tool of applying unilateral pressure. Now the Syrian TV company, please. Mr. Lavrov, at what stage is the Syrian crisis right now and what stands in the way of resolving the crisis and will we see this year the restoration of relationship between Syria and Turkey and other countries, for example the EU or the Arab countries? The Syrian crisis is an advanced stage of settlement. We have seen progress on almost all of the tracks, including military and political, the diplomatic track, the humanitarian track. Still lagging behind, though, is the economic track, because our Western partners, some countries in the region, are coming up with preconditions. And those preconditions are subject to change depending on the situation. The first is said, once the political process is launched, then we will lift all the limitations on providing any help to the Syrian Arab Republic for the return of the refugees, for restoring their economy. Now the political process has been launched, but now they say that uh, we need to see the first results. And so they continue to postpone and to change the conditions, and this is not helpful and this does not lead to good results. But the main thing is that we have, uh, the terrorists have suffered a major defeat. The remaining hot spots of ISIS resilience and al-Nusra fighters are mostly located in the Idlib de-escalation zone and the Eastern Bank, where there are around 10,000 ISIS fighters. They are mostly in the camps which are controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces. Those are mostly Kurdish formations. And we have um, been receiving some alarming information regarding the fact that for a certain payment, those Syrian Democratic Forces are releasing those fighters who are now spreading 
all over Syria. And uh, this is indeed a very worrying uh, information that we are receiving. We have informed our American partners who have some influence over the Syrian Democratic Forces that the fighters that are kept in camps under guard as prisoners, those fighters should not be allowed to leave those camps, but there is such risk. Humanitarian aid, I have mentioned that, is provided and the Syrian government is cooperating with the UN. So basically there are no reasons to keep uh, the transborder aid delivery mechanism in place without any consultations with the Syrian Arab Republic. And humanitarian aid allows to create the proper conditions for the return of the refugees. We are also doing a lot in our national capacity, not only making contribution to the relevant United Nations foundations which provide aid to the to Syria but also through our military which are present on the ground the military police and other formations we are trying to restore all the life systems for example water supply energy supply creating um, the basic conditions for education and health care we are calling upon all the countries to follow suit and not try to politicize the situation and try to come up with some geopolitical demands when it comes to delivering humanitarian aid. As for the political track, I've said we have seen some results. That is the creation of the Constitutional Committee. This committee has now formed a drafting group and they've held two meetings and the third meeting is being prepared and as I understand next week we are expecting to see uh, the special envoy for Syria, Mr. Patterson who plans to, to visit Damascus as well and I hope that our negotiations and his trips in his context with the Syrian leaders would allow to form a, a schedule for the further work of the Constitutional Committee. We are convinced of the need to rectify the mistake that was made then back in 2011 Syrian Arab Republic was excluded from the Arab League and now we need Syria to return returned to the Arab family, as the Russian president has said at multiple occasions. Now, Rai. Mr. Lavrov, good afternoon. Rai, Italian television. Italia has long discussed Libyan crisis with Russia. What mistakes do you think have been made by different Italian governments in recent years with regards to Libya? And what we, the Italians, can do now as different from the actions we took in the past? And what do you expect from uh, the conference in Berlin? As for the mistakes, the main mistake was not made by Italy, it was made by our colleagues in NATO, where the leading role was played in 2011 when the decision to bomb Bad uh, Libya was made and to topple the regime in breach of the United uh, Nations Security Council resolution was played not by Italy. I would not like to name those behind that event, but I guess you're all familiar with them. And since then, Libyan statehood was destroyed, and so far it has not been restored. There were many attempts to provide aid to various sides of Libyan conflict so that they would reach some consensus and would and the Libya would return to its normal state. There was the uh, Syria Accord, which is considered by foreign players as the accord which includes the main principles for the settlement. Of course, we are moving on and maybe some principles should be added to this accord. There were agreements at the start of the last year in Abu Dhabi. They also touched upon um, strengthening uh, statehood in Libya. There was a conference held in Paris. And we've even negotiated a particular date for holding the elections which were supposed to take place. 
But as we know, you shouldn't think about some very concrete results when it comes to such distant future. There was a conference in Palermo as well. We have done some useful things at that conference as well. Uh, we have, uh, in response to the proposal uh, from Turkey, we've uh, decided to make a contribution to these efforts, and we've invited the leaders of the East and the West of the country. They have accepted our invitation, and for several hours, I guess for seven or even longer than that, we have held talks with the delegations of Marshal Haftar and Mr. Saleh, the head of the parliament, and the head of the government, uh, Mr. Saraj, and the head of uh, the State Council. And as a result, we have a text which we believe is well balanced, which calls upon a ceasefire in the start of a political process. It was signed by Saraj and Mishli. However, Marshal Hafter and Mr. Salik have required some time for consideration. But the truce, uh, which was declared before they arrived to Moscow, is being adhered to, and this is a great step ahead, and we will hope that it will remain in place, just at least for some time, and recently Heiko Maas met um, uh, Mr. Hafter in Gaza, and he said that Marshall confirmed uh, that he is going to stick to the ceasefire agreement. And the Berlin conference, uh, we supported the idea from uh, the outset, because the more countries want to help the Libyans to create the conditions for the settlement of the crisis, the better. It's not uh, easy to convince those people, but we need to unite them. So this is um, what we are working with uh, during uh, the conference in Berlin. We have taken part in all the preparatory meetings, and the documents are almost negotiated and they are fully in line with the decisions made by the Security Council on a Libyan resolution and they do not contain any items that might contradict the United Nations Security Council decision and we tried as part of the negotiations to make them balanced. The most important thing is that after the Berlin conferences, if everything goes as planned, the UN Security Council will endorse the outcomes of the Berlin conference. The most important thing is for the, the, the sides in the Libyan conflict not won't repeat their past mistakes. They don't start any additional adding any additional conditions and starting to accuse each other. There is a lot of tension between them. They don't want to be staying in the same room, let alone. Uh, meeting each other and talking to each other. So together with our Italian colleagues, we'll take part in this conference. With uh, Minister Di Maio, I have um, a meeting planned on, in the morning in Berlin um, before the conference at the high level. Almanar, please, you have the floor. Almanar, please. Yes, you, you. Mr. Lavrov, congratulations, um, Happy New Year, and a belatedly Merry Christmas. Considering the latest constitutional changes suggested by the President of the Russian Federation and new appointments, what's your view and interpretation of the new doctrine in the foreign policy? of the Russian Federation. So we think that the foreign policy course is dictated by the president, well, not dictated, but uh, a different word, it's been um, defined by the president. So this interpretation in details and on the practice, what about the international law? We've been used to, to the idea that you have always used these terms. That we believe in international law, we support international law. And now I believe that in, that strengthens the sovereignty of the Russian Federation and that's um, a step towards protection of national interest. However, in practice, what changes would be brought on by that? Now, the second thing about the, the situation in Lebanon, the day before yesterday, there were the so-called revolutionaries uh, demonstration there, and for the first time, they came close to the perimeter of the Russian 
diplomatic mission in Lebanon? Is that maybe some kind of a message of external players that are supporting or moving these processes? Maybe that, that's the beginning of a, of a certain siege, you know, so to speak. Maybe they try to send a message to Russia that it's about its politics in the region. Now, as for the first question, I have already it was already commented by the President about our attitude towards international law and how it corresponds with our own legislation and our constitution. The Constitution, as it was um, cleared and clarified by the Constitutional Court, is the basic and the key norm that defines all our actions. No international agreements should run counter to our Constitution. However, I'd like to highlight the following. Any international agreement that is adopted by the Russian Federation that Russia accedes to is signed and brought to ratification to the Russian Parliament, to our Federal Assembly. Ratification is a federal law. Therefore, our international obligations become the part of our legal system as they uh, brought in the form of federal, federal law. Now, the second thing, a federal law cannot be adopted if it runs counter to the Constitution. So I do not see any um, reasons for speculations or trying to find some kind of a subliminal sense here. As for Lebanon, we appreciated how Leb Lebanese leadership and the services responded to that incident. I do not see a reason to promote the conspiracy theory here or any um, ideas of a plot. As far as I understand, right next to the embassy there is a center, a detention center, uh, where the people have been detained, uh, those who have taken part in demonstrations and the rest of them try to free them. So these I understand that these uh, smoke uh, bombs have been thrown, but that they did not cause any damage. And I understand that Lebanese services have uh, highlighted that will uh, pay special attention to providing security to our diplomatic mission. Please, Russia Today. Madam Zakharova, Mr. Lavrov, dear colleagues, my name is Ilya Petrenko, RT channel. Mr. Lavrov, you started your uh, introductory remarks with the, uh, describing the world as feverish. Indeed, last year we saw a lot of protests around the world, and it, that happened um, in Latin America and Hong Kong. The main question is, how is this uh, contamination coming along? We saw support of these movements by Washington in majority of cases. We saw that these sentiments have been uh, artificially man manufactured. Now, the year 2020 started, and uh, this new pressure politics is starting. We see that there is an American-Iranian crisis. My question is the following. Should we be worried about this trend, the continuation of this trend in 2020? Should we expect new Venezuelas? Uh, countries with uh, two authorities, so to speak. So uh, what's the destiny of Iran in 2020? You know, it's, it's very hard to, to make any forecasts here. There is a great saying by Mr. Chernobyl, uh, may he rest in peace. It's very um, an ungrateful thing to make forecasts, especially about the future. So making forecasts about the future, especially about the behavior of our American colleagues now, that's very hard to do. We have outlined several examples of their behavior. It's hard to foresee what 
what could become a norm in the following year, but um, we can rule nothing out. I've mentioned it multiple times, that the international law is being substituted by rules based order that the West needs, first and foremost. There is also an attempt to postpone the shaping of a democratic and polycentrical world order. The West tries to contain the establishment of major powers. We see that there is tension in the trade dialogue between China and the U.S. On the whole, the World Trade Organization has a dispute authority. This body, I think, cannot gather for, for, for a year now, and it cannot function because the, the U.S. is blocking the appointment of participants of this mechanism, so they do not have the necessary makeup. Instead of solving the, the issues that are happening in the global trade through universally agreed upon an international legal mechanism and a body for settling disputes of WTO, the U.S. prefers to, um, to work on one-on-one -on -one with their competitors. Just today in the morning, I heard that the European Commission has expressed concern whether the recently achieved American and U.S. agreement does it violate the principles of free trade and WTO norms, and the European Commission uh, leaves the right to go back to this issue later. If we talk about the things that uh, deal with international security, the uh, weapons of mass destruction proliferation, there are also attempts to take the, these processes and matters into their own hands and not to allow a transparent Transparent universal dialogue with a view to find a consensus decision that will be endorsed by everyone. You can see what's happening in OPCW. I've spoke about that multiple times. Quite illegally, the technical secretariat has been mandated to identify who's at fault in blatant violation against the Convention on Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. The same approach is attempted to be used at, um, for the Convention on Prohibition of uh, Biological Chemical and Biological and Toxin Weapons. We suggested multiple times to create a verification mechanism, and the U.S. are blocking this decision, and they try to use secretaries of international organizations using the UN Secretariat to uh, push through their backdoor bilateral uh, contacts, which are non-transparent, and they have an interest in creating biolabs on uh, post-Soviet uh, space, and they work with Pentagon. That these are serious matters, and they're of concern for everyone, but the, the Americans do not want to review them honestly and openly with participation of everyone who signed the Convention on Prohibition of Biological Weapons. You've mentioned Iran. Indeed, there is a JCPOA, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action on the Settlement of, around the Iranian Nuclear Program, and it's an inviolable part of international law, endorsed by the UN Security Council, with a resolution, which is an obligatory resolution, it's a binding resolution. But the U.S. decided to apply their own rules, and they have withdrawn from that comprehensive plan of action. They did not only stop implementing it, they discontinued their obligations but they prohibit everyone to trade with Iran, and they demand that Iran continues to implement the document that was called the worst uh, deal in, in, in of the world by President Trump. But Trump, uh, but, but the world has to bend to the U.S. will and to not trade with Iran, and Iran has to continue to implement this document. It's a very alarming situation. And now it's it's uh, taking a very dangerous turn now. Three uh, participants um, the, from the EU in JCPOA, UK, France and Germany have um, sent a letter to the high representative of the UK, of, of the EU, uh, to Mr. Burrell, and they say that they want to start the procedure of dispute settlement. 
It is stipulated by the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. As a matter of fact, it, this is a, uh, not an open letter, but I can tell you about it because we, we have the information. And what's happening right now is what President Putin has warned us against multiple times. He said that at a certain stage, Europeans will use some situation around Iran, some kind of draining actions, in order to blame Iran, uh, breathe out you know, sigh, uh, sigh with relief. And we have uh, said that multiple times. Iran has said that uh, it will continue to do some things voluntarily, going beyond uh, uh, safeguards and IAEA and other obligations. And everything that's happening in Iran, in nuclear sphere, is transparent. It's done in the presence of the IAEA inspectors. Iran is the most verified country in the world among all uh, NPT members. Now, the question is, so these European countries they said that now it is up to Iran to take measures. They expressed regret that the U.S. have stepped out of the JCPOA. However, these demands have been addressed uh, with certain accusations. They have been addressed to Iran. And yesterday I've read some news that the Minister of Defense of Germany has conf confirmed the rumors that before this letter was written by a foreign minister of the UK, France and Germany, Americans have given an ultimatum to these three countries, threatening them to introduce a 25% tariff on um, car production and, and something else. If these three countries do not abandon JCPOA, and start promoting signing a new deal that, that would be uh, initiated by the U.S. Boris Johnson said that right away, let's forget about the last deal. That will not be an Obama deal, but it will be a Trump deal. So you can see that the methods that are being used by our American partners, they're uh, quite diverse. And what will happen in the future, I cannot simply predict. However, we continue dialogue with the Americans as well as with the Europeans on all matters. Yesterday there was a meeting with Deputy Foreign Ministries, Deputy Secretary on strategic stability, and the whole array of issues on the agenda was discussed, especially the topic of uh, predictability, of certainty. I cannot say that we achieved some um, tremendous results, but we continue our dialogue and will strive to do the following, so that our world will not be left without any kind of agreements that will control and uh, armaments, especially nuclear arms and proliferation, weapons of mass destruction. The president, in his address to the Federal um, Assembly, has expressed this special interest in the role of the P5 in the UN Security Council. According to the UN Charter, it's not a privilege, you know, it's, it's a major responsibility to be a permanent member and to have a veto power. Indeed, that is a great responsibility. And you cannot just simply wave it away. So the call of our president, so that the P5, the UN Security Council, according to the Charter, become aware and show their responsibility of everything that's happening in military and political security in the world. I think that this urge and call should be heard. Um, Dorst, please, you have the floor. Mr. Lavrov, my name is Vasily Polonsky. I'm right here on Dosh TV channel. I have a question about Central African Republic, about the murder of our three colleagues, journalists. Recently, there was an information that local enforcement has burned down the clothes of the journalists, and it's important evidence. Has Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs applied to their colleagues in the Central African Republic because material evidence cannot be burned out because the investigation is not uh, yet being closed? Indeed, we have um, contacted them. I did not hear about this specific incident with the burning down of clothes. Um, I'll be honest, but our investigative committee has initiated a criminal case. 
And we have commented on this situation multiple times, and Maria Zakharova, our official um, spokesperson, has commented on that, and we said that the investigation should be done by, by the relevant authorities, and that is the investigative committee. And we commented from the position of our ministry. It is responsible for the creation of the necessary conditions for the travel our citizens abroad. We have forewarned everyone, especially journalists and other people as well, that the goals that have been put down on the visa application should be in, in line with the true goals. That is a, a, a terrible tragedy. And we'll strive to bring the investigation to the end. I understand that the profession of a journalist is very dangerous. And annually, there are victims uh, among journalists. However, as for hotspots, it's always better to work with a you know, notification of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I understand that it's your right not to inform us. But in order to be a little more safe, I'd like you to, to view such a possibility. If you're traveling to certain dangerous parts of the world, that applies to you and your colleagues. Kia ora, please. Uh, Japanese uh, Kia ora, please. You have. Good afternoon, Mr. Lavrov, Kia ora, Information Agency. I have a question about negotiations with Japan. Last year, when you traveled to Japan, to Nagoya, you said that the Russian side has provided a list of specific concerns to the Japanese side. As far as I understand, your concerns include the placement of the U.S. Um, strike units in, in Japan, so the question is, in order to move forward in the negotiations with Japan, the Japanese side should give a guarantee. What this, um, should this guarantee be? So the ally relations with the Japan and the U.S. continue. So that means that uh, your concern cannot be alleviated. <laughs> well, actually, you've just said it all. You've just answered. In fact, it's a very serious question, an important part of our dialogue with Japan. And this comes not only the overcoming of our crisis, not only the peace agreement. It's a good neighbor of ours. This is how we deem Japan. We don't want the, it to think that there's a threat posed by Russia. Of course, we have concerns. We've put them down. We discuss them within the dialogue between our foreign ministers and within the heads of sec security councils dialogue. So the Patrushev met his counterpart and they discussed this topic as well. You just mentioned that Japan deploys the air defense system made by the Americans, the land-based ones. And Japan told us long ago that this is done to protect Japan from the threat coming from the Korean Peninsula, and that these air defense systems would be controlled solely by Japan and would be deployed and employed only by the Japanese armed forces. We try to understand the details here, but, well, that's not what matters. Japan purchases launching systems for the air defense systems, same launching systems that the U.S. has already tested, and this goes not only for the air defense system, but also for cruise missiles, and these are the weapons that are prohibited by the INF Treaty back at the time when it was in force, before the Americans withdrew. And this is close to our borders, so of course we have to take this into consideration. We are not suspicious of the fact that 
that the Japanese leadership, the political establishment, has any plans, malicious plans against Russia. But, in fact, as you've just mentioned, you have a military alliance with the U.S. And if you have a look at the documents and statements, as well as the decisions within this military alliance, you'll notice that the U.S. employ this alliance to reinforce the policy that Russia has to be contained because it's an enemy. And Japan is part of this military strategy of its closest ally, the U.S. Of course, we need some clarity here. We want to understand what our cooperation would look like, and if the Americans try to involve Japan into its politics, and not to use it against Russia. So, in fact, we do want to have clarity here. Associated Press. Associated um, Press. Allegedly, on Tuesday starts impeachment in the Senate. Many in the West say that this would weaken the American support to Ukraine and would reinforce Russia's positions. What do you think about this opinion? I don't know. It's your impeachment. You are an American national. You know better. BRICS television. Good morning, Ksenia Commissaria, BRICS TV. In October, you said that BRICS is an example of and a standout of multipolar diplomacy. What are the key goals of the BRICS that have been achieved? Perhaps we can speak about new goals for 2020. You know, this is a fact-based question. On the Foreign Ministry webpage, there is our program, and we can additionally send it out if you want to. We have prepared answers to typical questions, and on our webpage, you can read it all. But we have planned more than 100 events within our president's presidency. Many would take place not only in St. Petersburg and Moscow, but in the Urals as well. This goes for the ministerial meeting, for example. This summit, uh, summit of BRICS, would take part in St. Petersburg in the mid-July, so we are actively preparing. Baltic Countries News. The uh, Latvian Parliament accused Russia of falsifying the history of the Second World War. As is known, quite often historic falsifications is something that the Baltic countries are engaged in. Unfortunately, international organizations listen to them, and at the end of the day, we have documents and instruments such as the uh, resolution of the European. European Parliament that shift blames um, for the uh, start of the Second World War on Russia and Soviet Union. So how can we stand up for, uh, for the uh, historic truth and what steps to be taken here? What do you mean by how we have allowed for this? Are we, what can we do with the fact that neo-Nazism is on march in the European Union? We cannot take any coercive measures to influence the situation, but what we can do is to shame the EU for this, but they avoid any discussions, shy away from them. We need to respect the freedom of expression and so on. By the way, this is the same reason why the general, why they restrain and abstain in the General Assembly when we submit the uh, resolution on the prohibition of the glorification of Nazism, on various ideologies and so on. By the way, the Americans always vote against, which is also doesn't come as a surprise as the Americans don't want to restrain themselves in anything. and as 
for the Ukrainians who also vote against, they wouldn't be able to counter the neo-Nazi radicals who control a lot of areas in that country. But when international organizations support such things, I don't agree with them, because the UNGA, with the overwhelming majority, annually approves the resolution that condemns any glorification of Nazism. European Parliament is also an international organization, but it's not universally recognized. And this organization, as well as the European Union, approves things that are initiated by the minority. They refer to the consensus rule, the necessity to take into account each other's opinion, but this is mainly the minority. The Baltic countries and a number of other countries who play a first role here. But as for factors, specific facts that have been presented by President Putin in his address during his meeting with the CIS heads uh, in St. Petersburg in December last year, I think that the reaction was because those people felt the blame. The president said that he is working on a detailed article based only on, artic on facts and new data that we have found in the Russian archives. By the way, Foreign Ministry yesterday published archives that have never been published before on who liberated Warsaw. The Polish side, through its own diplomats, said that it was really interesting to, would be interesting to implement Putin's idea and to peruse the archive materials. So the archives are ready and we are interested to know what the Polish side is going to tell us once it peruses these materials. But the attempts to smear our country in terms of the outcomes and reasons for the Second World War and the attempts to use these lies to weaken today the position of Russia globally, these attempts would continue. Next year, Jerusalem would hold an international event with the participation of uh, including Vladimir Putin to commemorate victims of Holocaust. And it is known that our Polish colleagues, who've just announced that the president of Poland is not going to attend, maybe because Putin is going to, so we know that our Polish colleagues try to persuade the Western participants of the ceremony, and these includes the U.S. and European leadership, persuade them for them to elaborate in the addresses their own opinion on the Russia's position regarding the Second World War. By the way, these methods are not conscientious. Khabar, please. Khabar TV, Kazakhstan. Within several special operations, Kazakhstan returned several citizens, including children. As for Iraq, we returned 14 children who have relatives in Kazakhstan, according to the DNA analysis. What, are, what is your opinion on the actions of Kazakhstan to return its own nationals from these places? Any sovereign state is entitled to take such steps to fulfill its own obligations to respect its own citizens. We also do this, our special forces and the military as well as the Ombudsman for Children's Rights. They do everything to return our children from Iraq and Syria. We exchanged experience with our colleagues in Kazakhstan. I was in Uzbekistan yesterday, and there they also do everything to return their nationals from these places, at least the wives and children. As for the militia, this is a separate topic. I've already touched upon the problems that we 
base in the east of Syria when the militia break away from the detention camps. But as for women and children, well, most women were just brainwashed and they were not there on their own will. And of course, we need to return them to a normal environment for them to be in presence of normal people and not radical extremists. Minister, Happy New Year. I wish luck to interpreters as well. I think that the world would be worse if it wasn't for you and your politics. What do you think about the adequacy of Polish authorities and what the Polish do regarding the uh, uh, monuments to Soviet soldiers and cemeteries. In the interview with the first channel, the Russian channel, uh, the uh, Polish authorities said that Andrei said that he is going to Russia. What do you think about his opinion that the Nobel Prize would rather be uh, awarded to a different president. As for the attitude towards monuments, I've already um, touched upon the problem of the attitude towards the Second World War in general, and I'm convinced that here we need to look only at the historic facts. We need to have a dialogue based on archive materials. For a long time, together with Poland, we have a whole bilateral mechanism of interaction. And it had also a strategic committee headed by foreign minister, and there were other bodies represented as well. There was also a group of historians who were in charge of complicated issues of the past they always protected their position based on scientific facts. By the way, this group even prepared a joint textbook on a certain period of our relations, of our joint history, and on a number of events of the period, we prepared joint articles, where the uh, ideas of the historians were different. We published separate articles view, recovering the Russian and the Polish opinion, and I think that we need to get back to these four for it not to become a prisoner of the attempts to turn history into a propaganda. Unfortunately, with our Polish colleagues dismantled monuments, they also somehow expressed their position. Moreover, their, their argument is that Poland never promised to preserve the monuments that are not in the cemeteries, and they are supposed to allegedly protect only the memorials that are part of the burial sites. But this is such a uh, belittling approach. If we follow this approach, then this is not a humane approach, because we are talking about people who sacrifice their lives to liberate Europe. That is why I share the position of those, including the President of the Czech Republic, who is against the dismantling of monuments of the times. As for the um, uh, current president, he is a respected person. He is known as an independent politician. He has his own opinion, and he is never afraid to express it. If he wants to visit Russia, then this is going to be his own decision, and we do our best for him to make his visit as comfortable as possible. As for a political visit, it's not a question to me. Sputnik, please. Uh, 
Извините, я с места... Да я вообще всем предложил бы с места задавать вопросы. Excuse me, I Меня have to remain seating. What is your opinion of the interaction between Russia and Germany after Merkel's recent visit? Do you think there's been a breakthrough or no? Because after five years, she's been here for the first time. Ну, знаете, я не думаю, что... I don't think that contacts between President of Russia and Chancellor of Germany, I mean in the modern conditions, need any breakthrough, need to be entered. They have regular interaction on margins of various events. Recently they met in Paris before her visit to Moscow, and they have regular phone-ins. They have really pragmatic and practical relations. Nobody tries to persuade each other of each other's position and say that you are right and you are not. We are, they don't think that they need to primarily solve ideological issues, not at all. They understand that there are positions, there are sanctions. We understand Germany's stance after the coup d'etat in Ukraine that, by the way, was followed by a situation when the position of Germany had been ignored this was an exaggeration. Germany was the guarantor of an agreement that the purchased violated. Well, Germany as well as other European countries just accepted the situation and the legitimate Austrian of the government in violation of its own will and signatures, and now they started deeming the situation only after Russia responded to the will expressed by Crimea when Crimea was back part of the Russian Federation. This is the problem because for them the starting point is Crimea, not the coup d'etat, the way it was done, and the fact that leaders of this coup d'etat adopted laws that abolished rights of the Russian-speaking minority, and this purchase from the nationalist and radical organizations demanded that the Russians leave Crimea. They don't even regard all of this, because for them it's all from the before. And when Crimea decided to be back with Russia, they were upset. This is the problem. Now, speaking of uh, the visit of the Chancellor Angela Merkel, this was by no means an extraordinary visit. Yes, our German colleagues were mostly interested in successfully holding the Berlin Conference on Libya, and we have dedicated a lot of time to that discussion. And they talked for an hour or so um, between themselves, President Vladimir Putin and Angela Merkel, and I talked to Heiko Maas and his team, and they also talked about economy, energy, the Nord Stream project, and in the, during the press conference and their response to questions, you've heard all that, and that was a very good working visit. And this is the pragmatic nature of our relationships. Austrian agency ORF, you have your mic in your armchair. Now you need to press the button. Austrian television, I have two short questions. You've said about Iran and you have attacked the United States and free European countries, but you have not mentioned what Russia can do in order to avoid further escalation in this conflict with Iran. And my second question is, we can see the formation of the new government of Russia forming. Are you going to be, to remain the Minister of Foreign Affairs, do you wish to stay? So you have been a journalist uh, for a long time, and you should understand that everybody laughed at your question. So I was tasked with being uh, uh, the minister, and I continue to be the minister as of now. 
I guess that you follow our initiatives, our statements about Iran, and we do not consider it appropriate what is currently being done to the GCPOA. The plan is that Iran limits its nuclear program to certain parameters when it comes to enrichment, when it counts to the amount of heavy water reserves and enriched uranium at about 4%. That is to say that Iran undertook responsibilities which go beyond uh, the universal agreements on the prevention of arms race and the IAEA documents. And in exchange for going beyond those documents, in response, they only got a promise that there were no limits on trading with Iran. The West did not make any extraordinary concessions. They just promised to leave any limits on trade operations, but they have not accomplished that. The United States have banned everyone from trading with Iran. They are threatening them with sanctions. The Europeans have tried to ruffle the feathers and create a mechanism which would, which would make trade with Iran possible regardless of dollar and would not be linked tied to dollar. This mechanism was created a year ago. It's called Instex. It was created just for operationalizing those deals which relate to humanitarian products and are not under American sanctions altogether. And when they said when the mechanism would be functional, it would also be spread to other items, for example, to oil, which is the main export item for them. And in the, during the past year, there were no deals at all. One deal was launched, but it has not been concluded. It's related to medicines um, and uh, the acquisition to the sum of $10 million. So you see, there's just the drop in the sea. So when Iran says that they are halting um, the implementation of their voluntary obligations, we understand this is not good for our cause, and this gives a reason for the Americans to escalate the situation even further. But we see the reason why Iran does that. They are not refusing to implement all the other obligations, the universal obligations of, or under their and PT treaty. And I guess that the Europeans should do more than this. There are also some peculiarities considering the decisions made by private businesses. You cannot make a private business trade uh, and uh, suffer losses. So if a private company has investments in the US or in any other countries and their investments which are closely linked to using uh, uh, dollar, then the company has to make its own decision on whether they are going to operate in what country. But there are also companies that do not have any obligations or any interest uh, in those areas where American lawmakers uh, have certain influence uh, in and can thus impose limitations. So now we are discussing what we can do next. And our representatives, deputy foreign ministers, keep in touch with the European Union's foreign service. They serve as, they serve as a coordinator uh, for the GCPOA. And I guess that we should have a meeting soon to take an honest look at the situation and to understand uh, what everyone thinks about it, because our partners, the Western trio, the UK, France and Germany, convince us that their actions, that their criticism and their demands to Iran are only aimed at saving the GCPOA. But I would like to once again 
said the words of Boris Johnson, who said, just when we heard uh, those reassurances from the free capital, said that we need to cancel the deal made by Obama and strike a new deal with Trump. Then they tried to disavow those claims, but then he said what he said. And so we will discuss our next steps, and we need to have a meeting at the level of political directors, at least, of all the remaining participants of the GCPOA, of the European trio, Russia and China, and of course Iran. And we need to have an honest discussion with each other. Times of India. Please turn on your mic. Thank you very much for your interview to our newspaper about your visit, about your recent visit, and I would like to ask you what is your impression of your meeting with Prime Minister Modi? Have you managed to decide on mutual payments and national currencies when it comes to trade between Russia and India? And my second question is what is Russia's opinion? on the multiple attempts to discuss the issue of Kashmir in the Security Council, and although it failed in August of 2019. And what is your position about constitutional reforms in India and uh, the cancellation of the spatial status of Kashmir? As for negotiations in New Delhi with Prime Minister Modi and uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jai Shankar, we actually did not discuss uh, this issue related to national currency. We have intergovernmental mechanisms which discuss uh, trade relationships. There's a relevant commission in place, and this is tasked with resolving this issue. The Commission is going to meet this year. Those meetings take place uh, regularly. We have discussed uh, more political issues on our agenda, for example, our cooperation within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, our cooperation within BRICS, especially considering that Russia chairs both organizations this year. We have also discussed the general situation in the Asia-Pacific region, including one more new term that is currently being circulated, the Indo-Pacific region. We also had the Asia-Pacific region. Now we have now Americans have introduced uh, and promote actively this term Indo-Pacific region. For example, like the term rules-based international order, which is now widely circulated, they have introduced this new term as well. We've actually had a discussion not about uh, our attitude to a particular term or a particular concept. We have discussed uh, how we see building our cooperation further on a multilateral basis in our region. And our approaches are quite similar, and India and Russia both do not support any attempts to use those concepts of Indo-Pacific strategies in order to form any confrontational situations in the region. So India and Russia believe that it is important to continue to cooperate and act on the foundation of the structures which were already created with the initiative role of ASEAN. They have a security forum, they have a special mechanism in place for the meetings between the ministries of defense and the partners of this association. They also have such an important instrument as the East Asia Summit, where you can consider all issues with no exceptions. So from this point of view, it was very useful for us to see and to reaffirm that our positions are almost identical.
But um, we have to state that terminology that is being used is still very questionable. I have already asked our American colleagues, our Japanese colleagues, we could probably ask our Australian colleagues as well, because the US, Australia, Japan and the Republic of Korea do promote this very term. Does it mean that you change Asia Pacific for Indo-Pacific, that all Eastern Africa would take part in this new cooperation format, and they said no. Does it mean that the Gulf would be a part of these discussions because the Gulf uh, belongs to the Indian Ocean? But then again, they said no. So you have the same circle of participants as with the Asia Pacific region. But uh, some people would like to draw some lines of division between them. So they're not even trying to hide this. It was important for me to understand that our India and France are aware of that as well. Now, Afghanistan. Asian agency. How do you believe the crisis between Iran and the US would influence on the peace process in Afghanistan? I have not actually responded to the previous question regarding the discussion around Kashmir in the Security Council. You know that we always support a direct negotiation between India and Pakistan on Kashmir in accordance with the declarations and the agreements which the two countries have adopted. This is our principal position. For example, when somebody um, suggests that we discuss the topic of Kashmir within the United Nations. Please repeat your question. Afghan News Agency, how do you believe uh, the U.S.-Iran crisis would uh, affect the peace process in Afghanistan? Well, I believe the escalation between Iran and the U.S would not help to resolve any kind of crisis in the region because the tensions are rising as well. And the tragedy with the uh, Ukrainian plane is a very important wake-up call that we need to engage in de-escalation, but not in making threats and in overflights of military aircraft in the region. But when it comes to the practical dimension, we know that the Americans are one of the main players in Afghanistan. They uh, lead a whole coalition. They have their own forces in Afghanistan, and then they hold negotiations. They have renewed their negotiations with the Taliban. It's important to reach an agreement, so we support such negotiations, and then it would allow us to start uh, the intra afghani talks with the participation of all Afghans. This is the condition of the Taliban and this condition was actually accepted. We are trying to support this process as we can and through our own contacts with the Taliban whom we try to urge to come to an agreement and to move to a direct dialogue with other political forces in Afghanistan and we also keep in touch with the Americans and the Chinese we have a trilateral channel of communication and Pakistan recently joined this channel of communication and we believe it would be the right thing so that not only our countries, our four countries, in such an informal circle would exchange ideas on how to promote the resolution, but also that Iran would join us. And actually that can be possible. But what stands in the way is the anti-Iran sentiment of the United States and lack of any desire on the part of Iran to communicate with the Americans and try to help them in resolving this issue. So from all viewpoints, the relationships between the US and the Iran should de-escalate, but for that we might require some wisdom and those relationships would not withdraw from this dangerous line if uh, 
Americans would blame Iran for all sins, for all crimes in the region. Take whatever uh, question Iran is to blame, and Washington demands Iran to stop any kind of steps which could help them develop their ties, um, exert influence. This is just not feasible. All the countries in the region and all the countries in other regions uh, have their own interests, and uh, they project those interests to their friends, to their neighbors. It's important for them to promote their interests legitimately, but unfortunately that's not always the case. Just take the example of the illegal presence of the anti-terrorist coalition in the east of Syria. In fact, that further fuels separatist sentiment in the region. This is a very serious issue. So it's better for everyone to negotiate with each other. And Iran has suggested that um, there is a peace treaty between Iran and the Gulf country. And then uh, they uh, propose this uh, Hormuz peace initiative to uh, cooperate with the Chabo on ensuring, ensuring security in the region. We have uh, the same approach, and I have already mentioned that in the beginning we have the concept of collective security in the Gulf and in the neighboring regions. And we do not only talk about the need to gather together all the Gulf countries, the Iranians and the Arab countries, but also to further strengthen their efforts by the participation of external players, for example, the Arab League, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the P5, the European Union. I believe that in such a format we could launch the work of a conference uh, on security and trust in the region, if we may call it that. And then, going further, if we manage to start the process, then other countries could also join in. We might take other countries of the Middle East and Northern Africa. But unfortunately, the current disputes between separate Arab countries and the Iranians are way too deep. And in our context with the Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates and with the Iran, we have asked them to start a conversation. There is an understanding of the need to do so, but so far we have not managed to convince all our friends to start the appropriate work. In the Independent, the British newspaper, there's a hope that they are going to ask about the scribbles. So where? Last row. Can you hear me? I wanted to ask about the Ukrainian plane. Because last week we had a lot of discussions, the situation was compared um, between Russia's approach and Iranian approach with regards to MH17, and this was not a favorable comparison. And do you agree with Margarita Simonyan that in this case Iran acted as a real man? unlike many other countries, including uh, Russia. And I would like to ask about the ministry's position about the events of last week, because different representatives of the ministry up to the last point talked about this was only a fabrication from the West that I ran down the plane, although there were many, um, there was a lot of evidence even without any access to intelligence data, that something happened at um, uh, the altitude of 2.5 thousand meters. This is a catastrophe, not even talking about the photographs. So this was not true, after all. And the question is, do you see um, the point of apologizing to the families of victims? And what is your opinion about Margarita Simonian's words? So they don't want to ask the Skripals. No, they're independent. Who are you independent from? I don't know. 
You know, I cannot think back to the fact that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs claimed officially that the version that the plane was down, that this is a disinformation. We never said that. No, it was never the case. I, I, I cannot think of such a thing. Please, you, you, you can uh, refute me right now if you have any facts. Rapkov, your deputy um, foreign minister, um, Rapkov, I think he commented. You think or did he do that? I, I, I don't think about it. We did not make any official uh, statements. There were no official statements. We could not have done that. We only said that the, the truth needs to be found out. And we need to find the truth also in the case of uh, MH17. You know, I responded to the previous question, I, and I said, I mentioned the tragedy with the Ukrainian plane in connection with the building tensions between U.S. and Iran. I don't want to uh, justify anyone. This is, th that was a human mistake, and it was not deliberate. Everyone understands that, I think. Yes, they uh, want to, to get a compensation, that's the right of the relatives. And I think that the Iranian side will review all that. They admitted that that happened, that it was a mistake. I don't want to convince anyone that this did not have to happen. Of course, we want that for not to have happened. However, the, the Americans destroyed with an unprecedented operation and that undermined and cast doubt on all norms of uh, international law. They destroyed, uh, eliminated General Soleimani. And the Iranians have uh, responded in a uh, restrained fashion. They warned Iraq. There was a lot of information in the media that the U.S. were, were warned as well and they taken that into consideration as well. However, there is information that right after that attack, Iranians have expected one more strike by the U.S. They did not what shape or form it would take, but there were at least six F-35s in the air, in the space right on the border of uh, of Iran, and that's the information that I think needs to be verified. But I want to highlight how nervous that situation was, and it's always the case. I'm saying that there is Iranian approach and the Russian approach. I don't think I fully understand what what's, uh, what difference you mean here. And I want to highlight once again, just like in the case with the Ukrainian Boeing, we want to have the clarity with the Malaysian Boeing as well. I'd like to remind you of several things that our colleagues, including our Dutch colleagues, if we can, I, I know um, the Dutch, can we call them? Uh, ne the, our ne colleagues from the Netherlands, they try not to mention it. First of all, Russia was one of co-sponsors of the UN Security Council resolution, and it um, held several clauses that investigation should be conducted with all norms of ICAO. I won't give you examples what kind of norms should have been observed, but they are not. This resolution also requires that those who deal with the investigation have to uh, regularly report to the UN Security Council. There was not a single report. The investigative uh, task force was formed Ukraine, Australia, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Malaysia, whose Boeing was um, downed, was not invited. It was invited in, after six months, but not to participate in the criminal investigation, but rather to take part in the group of uh, uh, technical finding, fact-finding mission. When we asked why, and by the way, if there were certain uh, problems with us, uh, we could have been also invited to that group. We were not invited there, but we cooperated quite actively. And all the information that has been asked from us at certain point in time by the representatives of this uh, task force organized by the Netherlands, we have uh, provided all the information. We also had an uh, uh, on-site demonstration by Almaz Ante that produces the Buk missile. 
показал, uh, как это может проходить. And they had a simulation. They showed how it, that could happen in a real situation in real life. Uh, they provided some radar information, and it's raw data that they provided. Now, when we ask the question, where is the raw data from the Ukrainian uh, radars? Uh, they told that the, they told us that there was no information, and all those radars they turned off. Um, you know, just happened to be turned off. Just th at that very moment, just like when um, the video camera was turned off for the um, first half of the day when Skripals were found on the bench in the park. So that video camera that was, uh, that CCTV that was pointing at their house, it just turned off. And later it turned off. Also question why the Ukrainian side cannot give us the uh, conversation between uh, dispatch. And David Kaplan or someone uh, like that with the same kind of reputation. And they published, after five years after this catastrophe and tragedy, they published some kind of telephone conversations between the Russian representatives and Donbass representatives. Five years they've been looking for telephone conversations, recording. As for Ukrainian dispatchers, you don't have to look for them. These uh, transcripts should be automatically given to the investigative task force. The question is, where is the data from the American satellites? And it was mentioned that they have this data. Most important thing here, you know, when Malaysia was not invited from the very beginning to take part in this investigation, the four countries that have gathered together with the Ukraine, they didn't even mention that, you know, but we know it for a fact they, they initially agreed between each other that any kind of information that will um, be presented to the outside world has to be agreed between uh, with all four countries, including the Ukraine. And whether uh, Dutch parliamentarians have applied to the government with a question, why is it that uh, during that investigation the Ukraine is not being asked a question about the reasons why this uh, airspace was not closed down. The, the Dutch government is silent. There are many no, questions like that. The when the Dutch investigated came, came, though we have provided all the information we could for their applications, uh, and, and they say publicly, and my colleague allows himself, the Minister of Foreign Affairs allows, to, allows himself to say that Russia did not cooperate with the investigation when we present them with what we have done. And we ask, why do you make such claims? The response is the following. Russia does not cooperate because Russia did not uh, accept its fault, did not admit its fault. So they suggested we hold consultations, Australians and, and the Netherlands. You know. We agreed with an understanding, and that was a condition that we will review all the questions, all the issues that concern us as well. We'll respond to their additional questions, but all those things that I've mentioned, all these questions, we also want to discuss with them. And they try to shift away from that. What they try to say is that, you know, our investigation is not complete, but you're to blame, so let's start the talk about the compensations. Is that a real man's behavior? Do you know? You know? I don't think so. You know, when they approach this topic or the topic of Skripals or the chemical weapons in Syria coming up with a logic of highly likely, you know, that's uh, the story that we started today, when instead of international law, we have invented rules that are convenient for you, and they try to make you believe that. Um, if you would allow, considering that we said an uh, incorrect um, quote by Mr. Repkov, I'll quote what he has said. Otherwise, we give a, a reason for, for uh, cover lies. Mr. Repkov, on the 10th of January in Tokyo, has stated the following. Following the beginning of the quote, I am deeply convinced that trying to um, get some political points on this, on this tragedy is unacceptable. Let's give specialists a chance to analyze it, but starting the games is uh, not a decent thing to do. There, are, there is no reason to think that at this stage we could have some vocal statements. The end of quote. Now, uh, Russian television, please. Alexei Glavko, uh, 
Russia China. In a few days, it will be just one more year to extend of New START treaty. You and the President say that there is no signal from that side of the pond to say that they will extend the treaty or not. Maybe something is changing. Maybe you have some new information. Maybe you send in more and more insistent signals to Washington that it's time to deal with this issue. Yes, I did discuss it during my first trip to Washington back in 2017, and now in December as well, and Sergei Rapkov has discussed it with the Deputy Secretary Ford the day before yesterday, I think. Americans do not give us a final answer, and they try to put it in limbo. And by doing that, they constantly insert the idea of engaging China into these negotiations. However, we've explained our position multiple times. The president has made multiple statements about that. If there is agreement between all participants of the negotiation process, process will take part in that. If the U.S. believes that it doesn't make sense to continue without China, and if China desires to do so, we will also take part in that. But China has said it officially also multiple times that it will not take part in such type of negotiations by explaining that the structure of nuclear arsenal of China is drastically different from the nuclear arsenal of Russia and the U.S. And we said that we respect such a position of China and will not make China change their position. And why, why would we do that? How can we do that? However, the U.S. is somehow convinced that we have to take upon ourselves this role to convince China to respond to such a proposal by the U.S. I think this is a quite a strange proposal. The U.S. have wonderful dialogue channels with, with China. They have just agreed on, on the trade deal. So I'll say it once again. We fully respect Chinese position. If, at a certain stage, some kind of multilateral negotiation process will be agreed on by everyone, okay, we'll take part in that. But that takes time. Even if the political conditions become ripe at a certain point, if there is preparedness for a multilateral process, the negotiation themselves, it's not a month. And in one year, the New START Treaty will expire. And President Putin has said, has said it to Donald Trump and Mike Pompeo as well when he traveled here in May last year to Sochi. He said, let's at least agree to extend this uh, treaty so that we have some kind of safety net while we while you try to engage some kind of multilateral negotiations process. That's our position. It remains in place. We believe that, and our president has confirmed it once again. Um, in the fall, during um, the meeting with the uh, top brass leadership, we do promote uh, the extension of the New START Treaty without any preconditions, and we hope that the Americans have heard us We've said it multiple times. Well, for now, there are no clear-cut signals from them. Considering that we're running off time, two final questions, please. Yamal Television, please. Stanislav Tropila, first Arctic TV channel, Yamal. It is now that um, 20, year 20, 2021, 2023, uh, Russia will be chairing the Arctic Council. What kind of preparatory work is being done uh, in connection with that? And what's the role of our Arctic regions, considering that? Yamal, Russia. And a follow-up question. How efficient do you think our Arctic agenda is? I think that our Arctic agenda is quite extensive. And it is the result of work of a major interagency task force. It 
reflects the interests of our security, of our navigation, our economy, energy sector, as well as environmental protection and the rights of uh, indigenous peoples as well. Indigenous peoples take part in security council sessions, they take part in ministerial session, sessions, and I think the Arctic Council is one of the very few bodies that, for now, and I'm not going to wood here, are exempt from ideologization and politization. Very important decisions are made there. Decisions on cooperation in emergency situations, also, uh, God forbid, if there's an oil spill, also on scientific cooperation, on fishing regulations in the Arctic Ocean and a number of other decisions as well. And incidentally, we would like to uh, what we would like to see is that um, there are no uh, military methods in, in the Arctic. In that regard, we think that it's not quite correct to engage in NATO in that region to up into the northern latitude. When the heads of chiefs of uh, general staffs of the Arctic Council have met together met in order to provide the necessary level of trust. We suggest that we could renew such meetings, starting maybe with an expert consultation. The Council uh, is functioning. Our agenda will ensure coherence and continuity. Now Iceland is chairing, and we keep in close touch, and we'll continue to meet with the Minister as well. So closer to year 2021, I think we'll formulate a very specific agenda that will uh, have seamless transition of the processes that have been agreed on by all participants in economics, in environmental protection, also in ensuring good living standards of uh, indigenous peoples as well. Now, the last question, please, uh, Sputnik <coughs> Estonia. Good afternoon, Mr. Lavrov. I'm chief uh, Sputnik Estonia, Elena Cherosheva. Now, I, in my personal capacity, on behalf of my staff, I'd like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Russian Embassy to Estonia and Maria Zakharova personally for that support and help that has been rendered to Sputnik Estonia during these uh, hard times for us. For my colleagues in this hall, I'd like to remind you that Estonian authorities would like to start criminal invest investigations against Estonian Sputnik staff, uh, just for us working for uh, MIA Russia, uh, Information Agency Russia today, and we're threatened with five-year prison terms, so we had to discontinue our contracts with the staff, so just uh, the people would not get in jail. But um, I think we'll still have a good fight. So yesterday, your colleague from Estonia, Mr. Rainsilo, was discussing the si terrible situation with the Russian journalist in Estonia. He said that, and I would like to quote, it has to do with the protection of defense, of defense of Europe and freedom. So we have to be put in jail for Europe to be free. I would like to hear your comment on that. And one more very short question. Considering the rhetoric and those, uh, mildly speaking, non-diplomatic statements, not only by the Estonian government, Government, but also by the president against uh, Russia. What do you think? Vladimir Mr. Putin, will he uh, accept the proposal by Kali Lai? Does he review the possibility to travel upon her uh, invitation to Fina Ugorian uh, Congress in Estonia? And he also had an invitation by Mr. Rensselaer to travel on the 2nd of February to Estonia and take part in the celebration dedicated to the signing 100 years of a Tartu agreement. In fact, you've just mentioned facts that do not require any detailed comments. As for the specific actions regarding Sputnik, I think that this is outrageous and 
In fact, we require daily reaction from the OSCE to condemn this and from the Council of Europe, and we want to draw the attention of the European Union that their member states express their opinion that violates the uh, protected and loudly declared values of the EU. And the EU ha has nothing, can, can do nothing with this, and this is another blemish on the reputation of the EU. I just told you about the uh, reason behind the Ukrainian crisis. I'm concerned by the fact that in the EU, the leading countries such as France, for example, insistently promote initiatives to categorize the media and to determine who can be deemed as mass media and which of them are deemed as just an instrument of propaganda. I think this is the same problem, practically, and they conceptually test this at higher level. As for the uh, statements in Estonia, my counterpart repeatedly stated that they are not going to ratify the border agreement, that they want to cancel the Tartu agreement and the, uh, and the border regions. They state that it, one of the border regions has to get back into the legislation of jurisdiction of Estonia. As for the uh, visit, uh, Vladimir Putin met the president, and it struck me that uh, she had an adequate opinion of the good neighborly relations, but perhaps something happened to her once she was back to her capital. It's sad because we never try to stop our cooperation with them. And these were not our demands, but the requirement of international law to cancel the phenomenon of the dual nationality or a non-citizenship phenomenon. Main legislation requires that they grant citizenship upon birth and there has to be something that have to be in line with European values. Unfortunately, I have no more time. I thank you all. I have to attend another event. And once again, thank you. Again, congratulations with the new year. And I hope to see you again today. Two announcements briefly. Because you had a lot of written questions, we are going to give answers on our web page in written in just five minutes. And secondly, given that you all like photos and selfies, you can take a photo with the minister right after the press, uh, and this is not going to influence your schedule.